Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 454. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm Lee Gatiss, and it's Tuesday, the 30th of October, 2018. Okay, another guest on Anglican Unscripted. You're going to recognize the accent. A lot of you guys who watch say, hey, that's, that's Lee Gatiss. He does something very important because he's with some church society, something, something over in England. And you know one of the problems I have, Lee, is we never do proper introductions anymore in the show. So I'll get an email saying, who's David Old? Who's Lee Gatiss? (laughs) What's a uh, David Poligli? Who's a David Poligli? So I'm going to have you introduce yourself and tell people what you do. I'm the director of Church Society in the UK. Church Society is a very old Anglican evangelical organization in the Church of England. We, uh, You know that we're evangelical because we do three things and they all begin with the same letter. We do publishing, politics and patronage uh, and really partnership as well. We partner so together. Things. <laughs> yes, it's four P's. Let's start again. We do four things, and they all begin with the same letter. Uh, well, Bob does that, doesn't he, in some of the Psalms? There are three things that he likes. No, four that he really loves. Um, <laughs> publishing, politics, patronage, and partnership. And that's the th- sort of things that we're involved in. Basically, church society exists to strengthen local churches in biblical faith and to help shape the Church of England now and for the future. I live here in Cambridge, where it's a grey and nasty sort of day. Um, well, you may say it's always grey and nasty in England, but I do. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, I've been an, an Anglican minister in the Church of England for about eighteen years. Oh wow! So I'm having you on the program this week because I, I heard an interview you did with the BBC, and the BBC has a, a religion segment they do once a week, and they'll yes. cover everything from Buddhism to Islam, and if they see a conspiracy somewhere. They will call up some Church of England people and say, what's this conspiracy? And apparently um, some uh, church entities have been buying up some more property. So the BBC says, hey, they're buying property. I bet they're going to leave the Church of England. No, that's where I come in. Uh, obviously, that's a, I need to turn my phone off before it starts dinging here. You're going to help us buy or you're going to help us leave the Church of England? Which of the two? No, 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 no. So, the, the, you know, as far as the Church of England, you know, my desire, and I need to state this, you know, from the, from the beginning here, is to have full repentance within the church and return to unity. The whole church as a whole or the little church as in Anglicanism. You know, I don't care how it happens. That's my ultimate first and foremost desire. Short of that... You know, we'll have to you know, we have to work out the issues, and I see uh, times where we work out the issues through um, division, or we work out the issues through other ways. And uh, that I need to state that first. I'm not just calling up Lee to find you know division. It already exists in our church, but uh, I I do want to get an insider's view from inside the Church of England on why are you guys buying property. Is there more of a chance now that uh, minds are like, well, we need to look to the future because the future doesn't look so bright? Uh, they interviewed you. They interviewed Bishop Broadbent. And f- for the first time, I heard from you the words groundswell and that there may be a possibility some event in the future would lead some evangelicals to leave the church. Now, these words from Lee Gatiss, that's, that's pretty powerful. Well, I mean, I'm working very hard to make this um, not necessary, of course. Church mm-hmm. society is very much wanting to work within the Church of England to strengthen and reform it. But um, the BBC interviewer asked me straight out, what would it be like if lots of evangelicals did leave the Church of England? And I gave him a straight answer that that would gut the Church of England. Um, It's only a hypothetical situation at the moment. I don't think it's imminent, and I don't think it's inevitable. Um, I don't think we should buy the inevitable victory of the Liberals argument, because they want us to buy that argument. They want us to think we're on the wrong side of history in that sort of Marxist determinist way. Um, But I don't buy that history is moving in just their direction. So it's not inevitable, and it's not necessarily imminent, but it is possible. 
I think those who think that it's it's not a even possible outcome for the next few years that uh, lots of people may have to leave are living on a different planet. We have to think of contingencies and we have to think of ways in which there might have to be visible differentiation between the faithful and those who brought in innovations and new teachings. So is the BBC correct that this is just a conspiracy or why are we buying a property? Oh, well, I mean, they, they basically latched on to the fact that a couple of, well, two or three big churches, they'd found out that they had uh, five million pounds of assets here, four million pounds of assets there. And they thought, oh, they put two and two together and made 20. So I think they just made too much of it. And they, the, what they said was that these evangelicals are stockpiling assets ahead of a split. Which, of course, is, yes, it's a conspiracy theory because they're not stockpiling anything. You remember the man in Jesus' parable who uh, stockpiled the wealth rather than putting it to good use. It didn't end well for him. He, I think he ended up in the outer darkness or something like that. Something close um, to that, yes. So, you know, we're not stockpiling our wealth. We're trying to put our resources and steward them to good use. So there are churches which are buying buildings, but as venues for gospel ministry. There are churches which are setting up trust funds but as ways of paying for gospel ministers. So we're trying to buy venues for gospel ministry and people to do it, to, to pay for them to do it. So that's what we're doing. And if in some of those instances we find that um, the resources are outside the clutches of the diocese, well, so much the better, because uh, you know as well as I do that there are, there are laws in both the Episcopal Church in America, the Dennis Canon, um, and here in England, the 1956 Parochial Church Council's Powers Measure, um, which mean that the diocese thinks that it owns everything that its local parishes owns and has final say over those things. So if you want to invest a large amount of money somewhere, but make sure the diocese don't get their hands on it, and have a say over it, you want to spend it on what you want to spend it on, then you set up a separate trust with carefully subscribed, uh, circumscribed limits and, and goals and aims. And that seems a perfectly sensible thing to do. Evangelicals generally have set up trusts in this country for three reasons. One, to buy property, um, for venues, for gospel ministry. Uh, two, to help fund people to do gospel ministry. And thirdly, there's a, a reasonably new thing, which is evangelical setting up stewardship trusts to enable um, slightly better off evangelical parishes, help the poorer evangelical parishes to pay their parish share within the Church of England. So that is not a way to leave the Church of England. That's a way to strengthen the evangelical voice within it. So it's not really a conspiracy about leaving. It's a conspiracy to strengthen local churches in biblical faith and to shape the Church of England in an evangelical direction for the future. I'm all for that, Kevin. I don't know about you. <laughs> I am for a repentant church. <laughs> Let's Amen. talk a little bit about um, what happened last week. Last week, the uh, evangelical bishops put a, a couple letters. One was yep. a, a response to the living, love, and faith uh report or multiple documentation that's going to come forth and i thought you and i could talk a little bit about that because you obviously represent the evangelicals over there and i kind of want your thoughts to um what i saw in a letter very verbose lots of words yes. i read a little fear between the lines that they they had a, a couple of meetings they know what's going to come in previous reports the pillaring report and others uh, published by uh, Church of England bishops, the doctrine is pretty sound. Um, you know, the, they, they cover their tracks, they, they know what they're talking about, they use scripture, um, but they always leave a way out at the end. This is our doctrine, but boy, if you really need to cohabitate with the same-sex person, whatever. And so I think I'm reading between the lines here that this new report isn't going to be about doctrine. It's just going to be about a, a new way forward for the church to work within all these issues. Um, what are your thoughts on this? What have you heard? Well, what we've got going on now is um, a whole process of different reports and 
a suite of documents and possibly website resources as well that are being produced by various strands of this Episcopal teaching um, document or living in love and faith, as it's going to be called. What it will produce is a range of things on um, scientific, uh, biological, uh, theological, historical and practical uh, streams addressing the issue of sex, marriage, marriage and, and um, same-sex marriage, uh, the future. Uh, so as you do that, you get a, a, a range of people and diversity of people involved in working on these different streams. And can you imagine how difficult it's going to be pulling it all together? Um, the, the fear is that what they're going to produce is not a teaching document. Interesting, we've moved away from this uh, terminology of Episcopal teaching document to just calling it a suite of documents called Living in Love and Faith. Mm -hmm. The fear is it's just going to be a mapping exercise to say some people believe this, some people believe that. And what we do about it? Well, it's above our pay grade. Over to you, General Synod. Um, and that is that is that would be a, a terrible thing for this exercise to produce. What the evangelical bishops have said in their letter, essentially, over five or six pages, however long it is, is one thing. They're saying, we don't want a mapping exercise. We want you, what do they say, to clearly articulate and commend unchanging Christian doctrine on these subjects. That's what we want you to do. And only by reaffirming this teaching, you know, the, the teaching of the Lambeth Conference in 1920, mm -hmm. Canon B30, the 1987 General Synod motion on sexuality and homosexuality, the 1998 Lambeth Conference Resolution 110, by reaffirming that, and only by reaffirming that, can we maintain our unity in truth. And I love that phrase that they've used in this document, unity in truth. Some people want to divide the two, don't they? We have unity or we have truth. Um, but they're saying, well, we can only have unity in the truth, and we only maintain that by reaffirming unchanging Anglican doctrine biblical doctrine uh, and so I, I love that I love that um, insistence from these evangelical bishops that we must have an articulation of what Anglican doctrine is not just saying what various people now think and do there must be a standard against which we can hold each other but also for us to proclaim because we're all we all took oaths to proclaim afresh in this generation the teaching of the scriptures and the doctrine of the 39 articles, the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal. So uh, they are calling for us to do that. And I think that's a very, very helpful thing that they've done. It's amazing, actually, that the great thing is we've got bishops coming out with a public letter saying that. That's right. I know that many of them have said that sort of thing behind the scenes, but the fact that they can come together, almost a dozen of them have signed that, and to say this in public is very helpful gives us a bit of a rallying point and it also gives a standard against which we can measure whatever these uh, different working groups come out with in 2020. Um, obviously people within the church are thinking, you know, it's time for reform. Um, uh, they're getting a little tired, people are leaving churches, the churches are empty. Uh, only 2% of millennials uh, consider themselves to be residents within the Church of England. Things look pretty bleak, and I think under that bleakness, GAFCON has said, listen, we need to do something uh, to help the Mother Church. And I think GAFCON too, they said, we're going to work with the Mother Church and help encourage and, and flourish a relationship um, to uh, help those who are struggling within the church. GAFCON 3 seemed to be more of an approach to, uh, we need to set up a, a flag on the shores of uh, uh, England and allow people to leave if they want to leave the church. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go that way. And I don't know if you guys are hearing that type of message because uh, uh, I read another 45,000 page letter from bishops in the evangelical side of uh, <laughs> your church trying to describe the relationship or response to GAFCON. And I'm yes. like, okay, they get it, they don't get it, they love GAFCON, but they love to hate GAFCON. And I said, 
I need to talk to Lee about this. You're in the Church of England, and you can give me a, a perspective on either interpreting English ease uh, or what are the thoughts on, on GAFCON within the Church of England? Well, it was great being in Jerusalem to see um, bishops and people from all over the world, the Anglican world. And in the British delegation, there were many of us from all over the country of different strands, but there weren't many of our bishops. Uh, Bishop Nazar Ali was there. Uh, Rod Thomas was there, the Bishop of Maidstone, and uh, Keith Sinclair was there as well. And it was great to see them, but there were a whole bunch of um, bishops from the Church of England who would call themselves evangelical, um, who were not there. Now, I'll just tell you, between you and me, Kevin, and uh, yeah. all your listeners, that I, I did actually send a postcard to each one of the bishops who I wanted to be there, who weren't yeah. there, just from Jerusalem, saying, wish you were here, uh, signed, huh. you know, from Gap. Um, and those bishops have got together to write this letter um, to GAFCON, responding, as I think GAFCON wanted them to, to the letter to the churches that we put out at the end of the Jerusalem conference. And I think actually this this letter is very helpful. It's, it is shorter than the letter that they've written uh, to the uh, living in love and faith process. It's called Remaining Faithful Within the Church of England. Correct. And their basic point is that they want to have better communication with GAFCON as an international movement, and they want to work together as partners with GAFCON. I think there has been, unfortunately, a bit of a, a mismatch, a bit of a, a miscommunication perhaps, but also just a, a slight missing of the ways between the evangelical and conservative traditional elements within the Church of England and GAFCON. So that um, people in Com may get a somewhat jaded view of what is going on in England. Uh, they may only hear about Amy, the Anglican mission in England, and only think that there are a dozen or so churches in England that are doing any good. Correct. It's actually, yeah. there are hundreds of us, and there are lots of bishops too, who would agree with the, the GAFCON diagnosis um, and, and aim of proclaiming Christ faithfully to our nation. And that's what they want to say. They want to say, we want to be part of it. We want to be in partnership with you. But we have a few things that we need to get straight if we're going to do that. Okay. Um, so what do we need to get Some straight? Some things are, they could have maybe put better, I suppose, is yeah. what you're going to ask. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what they, they say in their letter, for instance, that they regret that no recognition was given to those who in good conscience believe it is right to stay within the current Anglican structure. Well, that applies not only in England, um, but also there are some communion partners still in tech and still in the church in Canada. Um, but there are actually a lot more of us here in England that that would apply to. But they also say, and I think this wasn't maybe as well phrased as it could have been, that they weren't convinced that Andy Lyons, um, the, the bishop who is um, consecrated by ACNA, Mm -hmm. uh, to be a bishop in Europe. They don't think he is best placed to represent an authentic Anglican voice and to articulate the need for and work for the reform of the Church of England. Well, it sounds like they're saying there they don't think Ang Andy Lyons is an authentic Anglican voice. That, That's of course, not is not... True. He's very he's authentic. <laughs> authentic <laughs> Anglican voice. Andy is, is a great teacher, very clear, orthodox, Anglican, evangelical voice. We love him. We think he's brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's no way that he's not an authentic Anglican voice. He is as, as authentic as Canterbury. Okay. Yeah. Of course, his doctrine is probably closer to authentic Anglicanism than a large proportion of vicars in the Church of England today. Uh -huh. So that, that, I think, was perhaps not as well phrased as it might have been. Um, but they, what they're talking about is that in terms of GAFCON UK... The need for the GAFCON contingent here in the UK to relate to the international scene, it's probably better if it wasn't Andy Lyons leading that and being the only face for that. And I can see that they have something of a point there, and many of us have said this to, to people in GAFCON and people uh, and to Andy himself, that Andy represents one particular strand of orthodox Anglicanism here in England, but only one. And there are a whole lot more of us who are actually still in the Church of England, fighting and contending for the truth of the gospel and planting churches 
so many more of us than there are in the Anglican mission in England, despite the great work that, uh, that Amy is doing. So it would be better if the leadership of GAFCON UK was shared, perhaps, with great bishops like Rod Thomas, Keith Sinclair, or Michael Nazir Ali. All of those took the lead as the, the, the figurehead, I suppose, sure. of GAFCON UK. I think yeah. that's what the bishops, I'm hoping that that's what our bishops were trying to say, and that they've only accidentally cast doubt on Andy Lyons' authentic Anglicanism, because I think they'd be wrong to do that. I, and I agree with you there. It's one of the interesting things. I mean, when GAFCON 1 called for the formation of a, a new province in America, it was easy. There's going to be a bunch of victims. They're all going to be deposed. Um, there's not going to be a lot of people left intact that want to be part of GAFCON. Because it was, so that was a, an easy way to have an initial setup. The, this English thing is hard. There are people who have left already who need ministering to or you know want to have uh, an Anglican connection. There are those who are still, like yourself, I'm not going to say stuck in the Church of England, but are, have vibrant That's ministries stuck. within the Church of England and are doing quite well. How does GAFCON reach out to the, um, those people? And it's a unique situation at, at the very least. Now, Archbishop Foley was just over uh, on your shores. Did you get a chance to yes. talk to him? Oh, I only, only um, by messenger while he was over ah. this time. We, we're in regular contacts, but I didn't see him on his trip uh, this time. But yes, he's a, he's a good friend to many of those people here in England, both within and outside the Church of England. Mm -hmm. And we're glad of his partnership and his godly leadership in GAFCON as well. Sure. Oh, yeah. He's now the boss. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, well, I pray for him regularly because I do not envy him that job. Oh. Nor do I envy uh, Archbishop Ben Kwashi, um, oh. also a good friend of ours in, uh, in church society. If you follow his feed on Facebook, Archbishop Foley's, all he yeah. does is travel, 100%. What is it going to be like now that he's uh, running GAFCON? You, do, you can't travel 150 percent so uh, it's going to be interesting for the the uh Perhaps we need to clone him or something like that <laughs> yeah something going on all uh, right so uh, you remember something called brexit right brexit it, it sounds brexit. familiar brexit. Kevin. Yeah, it should it um we may many... hear about it on the news every single <laughs> Day. Many eons ago, uh, the, it was put up for a vote whether the, the, the Brits would like to leave the European Union. And uh, the, the democratic process in Britain, as it were, allowed for a vote. And Britain's, by I guess 52% uh, vote, said, we're out of here. We are sick and tired of the European Union telling us what to do financially, legally, fiscally, religiously, and it's time to find a different path. Not all of Britain voted to leave, but a large proportion. And I was expecting, wrongly apparently, that this would happen within a year of the vote, that there could be a mechanism put in place uh, where you guys could just uh, flee the European Union. However, the consternation within your own uh, government and parliament and the wickedness within the European Union have slowed this down. Now I hear there's an agreement that sometime in the future you will leave. But what's the latest? Well, you have a very interesting way of characterizing the democratic process and what has happened in the last two years. Thank you for that. <laughs> no. um, <laughs> it's my job. I made it all in exactly the same way, but that was fascinating. Uh, <laughs> just hear a sort of transatlantic perspective on that. What is happening? Well, what we do know that is happening is that in March next year, March 2019, we will leave. There is a date set. Mm -hmm. But they've also invented something called a transition period, uh, where for two years, as I understand it, whether anybody understands it is another question, but as I understand it, there'll be two years after that where European Union rules and regulations will still apply to us to some degree until we finally left at the end of uh, that period. So, yes, it, it's a more complicated thing to leave this club than I think many people anticipated. I always thought it would take a while, but nobody perhaps anticipated just how complicated it might be. Um, yeah, imagine if Texas voted to leave the union, which I believe they have the right to do if they want to. How difficult would that be to actually work out 
in terms yeah. of all the logistics. It would be tricky. And so it, it would take a generation. It, it would literally take a generation for it to, uh, to work its way out short of a civil war. And we don't want a civil war, uh, and we want to we want to keep good relations with our Euro European partners militarily and in all sorts of other um, positive economic ways. So it's tricky working out how we pull out of the EU and what we pull out of and what we stay involved in in some way and how. It's very complicated business. Oh, it I'm is. I don't have to negotiate it. And it's what the interesting thing is being Kevin is that. Um, uh, Theresa May, our new Prime Minister, who took over after that vote, actually mm -hmm. voted to stay. She voted to remain, but she somehow managed to get herself in a position as being the one to implement the leaving. So that has made things very interesting politically here over the last few years. Well, what I see interesting, and this is so off Anglican topic, is the other weaker countries. Oh, really? Are we not talking about Brexit, leaving and remaining in the Church of England? It's the same thing. I call it checks it. Checks it. Checks it. Do we leave the church or do we stay? Yeah. What I find it's interesting just, is that there are other weaker countries like Italy, uh, Greece, and other who, you know, are making it so hard that they're going to get kicked out. And, you know, I, I, to see, you know, the pain they're putting Britain through uh where other countries they're gonna just let go anyway so we'll have to see what happens the idea is you make it so difficult for britain and so painful that nobody else will try the same thing i know so there is a groundswell if i use that same word again there is a groundswell sure. in some other countries italy and in france as well um against the eu and of course i mean i go to Greece most years to to preach and teach there and a lot of my greek friends are not entirely enamored with the European Union um, on some issues. So, yeah, who knows what the future is for those institutions. We have to pray that any transitions that we have in our politically unsettled and economically unsettled period will be peaceful transitions. Mm, uh, indeed. And that yeah. this won't shake up a lot of other things in a negative direction. Though I do think we could do with a bit of shaking up generally and thinking about our core concerns and commitments as a society and that gives us an opportunity for the gospel in a period of uncertainty and difficulty when everyone's questioning the foundations of what's going on that gives us an opportunity to speak the good news of Jesus into the situation that's what I pray for for all of these brexit negotiations whenever I'm rolling my eyes as they appear on TV again it's like a P Monty Python script you know it, it, it just never, uh, what could be more outrageous oh wait they found it yes, <sighs> we found well, well Lee, don't I wanna... get me started European politics now, now that you started talking about Brexit <laughs> perhaps we can talk about Trump Trump who but maybe I oh you the, the guy who who you know here we got the midterm elections coming up in November uh, oh, a couple days away and so in who knows how it's going to go there could be a ground swell of red people showing up and vote uh, for the to keep the GOP in power, there could be a Democrat uh, surge that uh, kicks them out of Congress. Uh, Trump, just to be Trump, at the very last minute says he wants to const he wants to overturn the interpretation of the uh, I think it's uh, Amendment 14 or 16, where uh, any but any foreign person who is born here, your mother arrives uh, from Mexico or whatever, and you are born here you have citizen uh, u.s citizen birthright he says i i'm going to change the interpretation of that by executive order way to throw an election you know <laughs> it just like <laughs> just in case with two days well, to go I mean, you thought you were going to win you know in all this stuff about immigration refugees people wanting to move across borders it's above my pay grade in many ways but what i do know is that immigration and people fleeing from war and famine and all these things has always been an opportunity to preach the gospel. Absolutely. So if we're going to get lots of people coming to this country from Syria and Iraq and from Libya and go and all these places, that's brilliant because um, we have a gospel to share with them. And how could we be so heartless as to keep them from the gospel? So if they're going to come, that's really not my call. But if they're going to be here, then that's an opportunity again for us to speak the gospel to them and that's that's all that we want to anybody who comes to these shores and england already is a very 
cosmopolitan sort of place. Here in Cambridge, I think in one of my kids' schools, they had about 17 nationalities in oh, one. Oh, that's amazing. Wow. Yeah, and it was amazing. When I lived in London, my uh, my son, he was the only white face in his whole school, in his whole class, I think. Mm -hmm. Maybe there were six, six white English kids in the whole school. Um, so he wasn't used to, he was an ethnic minority when we lived in London. Here in Cambridge, there's a great diversity, 17, 18 different nationalities in the class. So this has always been a great thing about the melting pot. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity for That's us to learn American about- That's an American term. You're stealing our American <laughs> terms. I'll be talking about manifest destiny next. Just, just <laughs> That's, <watch>. right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> On well, that note. Preach okay. the word. Yeah, it's a preach the word. Lee, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Lee Gatiss. And you've been watching episode 454 of Anglican Unscripted. Mm -hmm.